Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 16. Verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Father, we come to before you this morning asking that by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would be able to understand what it is that you want to say to your church today. Your scripture is so jam-packed with usable knowledge that is imperative for us to grasp at different parts of our lives. And I am confident that this, uh, these verses we're going to look at today from John chapter 16 are going to impact different people in this room in different ways because we're all in a different place. And yet you have something to say to all of your people today. I am so thankful that everything we're going to read uh, out of this chapter in scripture today is highlighted in red. These are the words of Jesus. The entire Bible is inspired by you. It is God-breathed. It is, uh, it is given by the Holy Spirit for us. But these are literally words that Jesus said to his disciples when he was here, just before he was going to have to leave them. And I, just, I, I cannot think that there's not a little more power in that for us today if we're willing to accept it. And so open our eyes, open our hearts to what it is that you would say to us today. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. We looked at these verses last week, actually, but from the perspective of how the world will hate you if you love Jesus. This is so normal and natural for the follower of Christ that if it isn't true, if you aren't getting any pushback from the lost around you, then there's something amiss in your discipleship. And we should get together and talk about that and pray about that because it's just that odd. That should be happening. That was a valid teaching, but there's another context we didn't discuss that we must discuss. Something that grieves me much more than what we talked about last week. I, it's not hard to accept the fact that the, the lost hate what we're about. We, we used to be the lost. We know what it's like to be on that side of the conversation and to not have the Holy Spirit to not understand logically everything that's going on to not understand why these people are so different and why they look at things differently why they say things differently why they act differently why they treat people differently it's so easy to see from over here from over there it's very confusing because you don't have the Holy Spirit to help you discern what's going on so I, I'm totally comfortable with the lost being at odds with us but what's Jesus saying here they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. He's talking about the church. He's talking about the religious people of the time, the religious leaders of the time. He's talking about the brothers and sisters in faith of these guys. And he's saying, hey, the time is coming. We're not even going to let you come into their place of worship. Families are going to disown you. People are going to literally hate you. All this as you've seen them doing to me while I've been here. Plotting to kill me. Contradicting me. Shouting out against me. Trying to turn people against me. I'm about to be gone. They're going to do that to you. The people that you wish you could just count on are going to be the ones to turn against you. They will put you out of the synagogue they will come against you. Certainly we don't have to look very far to find a religious system that allows for the murder of Christians by its zealots. But what is the literal context of 16.2? Who is Jesus warning the disciples about? Those inside the faith, supposedly. Those called brothers and sisters. Those disciples who are accustomed to being with these people in lockstep with them when it comes to religious matters, to scripture, and to worship. To these God-fearing Jewish men, Jesus says, hey, God-fearing Jewish men will hate you. They will hate you so much because of your understanding of me and your connection to me that they will seek to destroy you, thinking that they are serving the Father. 
and, and literally in the, in, the, in the language there, in the original language, um, um, when it says that they'll think that they're, they're doing service to God, that's the same phraseology you, that you would use to describe what a priest does in the temple. Offering up a sacrifice to God. Worship of God. Jesus is saying, hey, people inside what you believe to be uh, all your life to have been the, the real faith are, are going to think that killing you is offering a sacrifice to God. This is why our connection to Jesus, our individual connections to Jesus must be self-sufficient and really personal. It's why being part of a Christian family or a Christian congregation connected to others who appear to be connected to Jesus is never going to be enough. It's not the plan. It's not the design. It's not how it's supposed to be. You have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You have to be connected to Jesus in such a personal, intense way that if everybody in this room turns on you, you still follow Jesus. In the church culture in America today, we're starting to see the effects of honest differences of opinion concerning very important doctrine. As, as the liberal ideas of many lead to a watering down of the teachings of Scripture on all sorts of topics, many supposedly within the church are choosing to twist the words of the Scriptures into new teachings that will allow them to continue to fellowship in harmony with a world that truly hates what the book really says. That's happening every day. And it used to be just tiny little pockets of people that didn't want to be different, that didn't want to make anybody feel bad, that didn't want to come off as judgmental. And so they found a way to make what the Bible says to mean something that it doesn't mean so that they don't have to be in arguments with those people all the time. That's to be expected. That's just the flesh creeping in to a little pocket. But these pockets have grown and grown and grown and grown. <laughs> To the extent that now you have wholesale denominations, pieces of wholesale denominations that are turning against what the Bible says. And not just saying, hey, we believe this. You believe that, but we believe this. No, they're saying, you, you're wrong. You are incorrect. And your interpretation of Scripture it has gotten aggressive. And who's cheerleading those guys? The rest of the culture. They've got all the support they can handle. Just not from the right place. And so what we desperately have to know is all the support we need is Him. If everybody turns on us for what we teach, so long as it is legitimate, He is enough. Always has been, always will be. You and me and us have to have our own faith. Our own understanding. Our own convictions about following Jesus the way he is commanded. No matter what. Because the day is rapidly approaching when others wearing the same team jersey we are wearing are going to turn on us. In a much more real way than they have done so far. And they're going to join the world against us. If Jesus tarries, it will come to that. Because it always comes to that. If we won't turn on Jesus and join the world against him, they will turn on us. I'm okay with that. I have no problem with that. But we need to settle that now. That's not a decision you want to make in the heat of battle. When the pressure is on. You need to decide beforehand what you're going to do when the pressure comes. That way you can be prepared because you can be praying for strength to stand in the evil day when it comes. As this happens, we, we will start to see many professing followers of Christ become true enemies of His. And therefore, true enemies of ours. Right? Which is why we have to try very hard to remember what we've been taught of how to, about how to deal with our enemies. A 
about loving them, about agape loving them. I was in a marital counseling session one time with somebody not, not a member of this church long time, before I was a pastor, a long time ago, just a good friend. And he's, he's just, the, the, the husband is describing these things to me about what's going on and what his wife's doing. And, and it was pretty, pretty bad stuff. She was pretty rough on him. And I said, uh, Bill, his name is not Bill. I said, Bill, do you consider her your enemy? He said, yes, absolutely she is my enemy. I said, okay, now we know what to do. And I went to the scripture where it says, love your enemies. Bless your enemies. Agape love. Choose to put yourself second and bless her no matter what. We don't talk anymore. He couldn't argue with me. He's a, he's a real believer. Once I took his honest appraisal of the situation and told him what the scripture said to do with it, he didn't like that. Now, he didn't turn on God. He did the right thing. He didn't turn on me. He just stopped talking to me. You see, you've got to let the word say what it says and adjust your life to it. There's too many people doing it the other way around. And that is just never going to work well for anybody. There is nobody doing that who will ever be blessed by their decision making you're putting yourself at enmity with God and it's setting yourself up as friends with the world and that will not work and so here's the thing when people that we think are inside the same tent we are turn on us and they're growing in number and growing in number and growing in number and they're getting more aggressive as they're getting more confident what do we have to make sure of that we don't treat them the way they treat us it's so easy to fall into that trap These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Jesus says. That word, that phrase, made to stumble, in the original uh, Greek is uh, scandalizo. Word we get scandal or scandalize from. It's a wide, broad term, but you know what the first word in the definition is? Entrap. It's, the, it's the, the thought of, hey, there's a trap laying there. It is set and armed. And if you're not careful, you're going to step right in it. And it's going to spring on you before you know it. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. People are going to turn on you. People who you thought were inside the same faith are going to turn on you. It's a trap. It's a trap. It is set and armed and ready to spring. Be careful where you step. Look where you're going. Choose your course on purpose. And don't step in the trap. It's totally missable. <laughs> the teaching is clear. If somebody in the church turns on you and you are right, now listen, you've got to make sure you're right. But if they turn on you and you are right, just be thinking, not today, devil, that's a trap. I'm not going to turn on them. I'm not going to treat them the way they're treating me. I'm going to love them and let you shine through me towards them. Because your word says sometimes when we are so closely aligned with you, even our enemies are made to be in alignment with us. It's very simple, as long as we're thinking. This is where, where sober-minded comes in to play. Be aware of what your possible choices are and know ahead of time which one you're going to make. They will put you out of the synagogues. This conflict will happen. If it hasn't happened to you yet, it's coming. Conflict from within. Another thought to this. 
these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They're going to do this. They're going to do this. Verse 4. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. We always think we need to know everything about the past and the present and the future in order to be equipped to handle life, right? Just give me all the information, God, then I'll process it and I'll know what to do. I'll be more prepared. That's never true. The worst thing you can be is logically prepared. Much better to be completely blindsided by things and have to rely on your God to react to them correctly. We're allowed to take in information on a need-to-know basis. And God is the only one capable of understanding when we need to know. That's hard to live with sometimes. But it's true. Why didn't Jesus open his interaction with the apostles like this? You know, the guys are sitting fishing or under a tree or wherever they were. He walks by. What does he say? Come, follow me. Why didn't he say, come, follow me. Be hated, despised, and attacked by everyone you've ever known. And then be killed because they hate you, because they hate me. Come on. would have been too much information for them to take in. It's all true. 100% true. It was too much for them to take in. They wouldn't have had the perspective that three years with them has given them that he is worth dying for. They couldn't have made that decision back then. I don't know who this cat is. I'm feeling drawn to him, but hey, sometimes feelings are goofy. I don't want to sign up on the first day to die. But after three years with him, they're ready to be enlightened a little more. Plus, during those three years, they saw Jesus easily handle all those who sought to oppose him or to do him harm, right? They've seen the conspiracies against him. They've seen people stand up in the synagogue and accuse him of being a demon. They've seen uh, people plot to kill him. They've seen people lie about him. And he's always made it just fine. Why? Because it wasn't his time, the scripture always said. He would be in front of this angry mob of people turning on him, yelling and screaming. You've seen that kind of scene before, if only in movies. And somehow Jesus just leaves. He's just gone. Why? It wasn't his time. If they knew in the beginning you're going to be set up to be treated like Jesus, they'd be looking at that like, no problem. Whenever they turn on us, we'll just disappear. That wouldn't have been preparation for what they're going to have to deal with either. A message of certain dangerous opposition followed by a time of not having to worry about powerful people being against them. That wouldn't have prepared them for what would come when he wasn't physically in the picture anymore because he was the game changer. Not their faith in that instance, in those instances, before the Holy Spirit. So he waits until just hours before his arrest, just hours before the cross, to make the point that he knew all along that this was how the story would go. But he kept going anyway. And that they should too. Because a God who knows what will happen in the future can be trusted when he says to you that even though he's about to leave, he will be coming back for you. They needed to know all of that first before they found out how this was going to play out. Again, a prophecy of hard times, of difficulties, of pain, of what the world would call failure. Destruction. A prophecy like that, given at the right time, is intended to bring strength and hope, not fear. No matter how bad the the news is, timing is everything on something like that. And so what did he tell them first? I'm leaving. But I'm coming back. It's going to be rough for you while I'm gone. But I'm coming back. Don't forget that part. When it happens, let the fact that it is happening remind you that I am God. So that you can trust this part where I said I would come back. 
he builds hope and strength into everything that he says, even when it is the worst news possible. Verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. This is a difficult to understand verse here. Because we know that Peter has asked that exact question before. So is it a contradiction in Scripture? No. We just may not be able to fully understand the difference between the two phrases. Could be a cultural thing. Could be a, a wording thing. Could be an inflection of tone thing. Peter has asked before, where are you going? And now Jesus says, nobody's asked me where I'm going. The meaning seems to be wrapped up in the mental context of the question. But honestly, that's just supposition. I'm going to skip that. One thing is obvious. Jesus seems to be pointing out that they're missing an opportunity to ask the question in the right way. In sorrow, someone who feels like they're about to be abandoned may say, where are you going? When what they really mean is, why are you leaving me? They don't really care where you're going. They just want to know why you're leaving here. Why are you leaving me? And I think that's what Jesus was seeing in the disciples there. And I don't blame them. Without the Holy Spirit, how could you come anywhere near comprehending what's about to happen or what Jesus has been saying? I think that's certainly the state of minds of the disciples here, and understandably so. The point is, they're having difficulty thinking of all this in the way he's been trying to explain it. True, I'm leaving, but it's to go to heaven and prepare a place for you there. And true, you won't have me here with you anymore, but trust me, that's a good thing. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Because of their great sorrow, it's hard for them to hear any positive spins on what he's telling them, but he continues to explain it anyway. Knowing that at some point they'll be able to remember what he's telling them now and take comfort in it all. Guys, you're not, you're not asking the right questions. You don't understand what your mindset would be. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Jesus is committed to making sure the truth is made available, especially, it seems, when his truth is in contradiction to our perception. They, they couldn't think of his leaving as anything but a negative. So he keeps hammering how this is how it has to be. And not only does it have to be this way, you're better off because it has to be this way. I know your hearts are troubled. He says, and you're an emotional train wreck right now. He may not have said that. There weren't trains. They wouldn't have gotten that either. <laughs> but here's what's really true. Whether it feels like it or not, this difficulty is for your blessing, not for a curse. Sometimes we've got to get to a point with Jesus where we, we just got to accept that sentence. See, Jesus says, I'm not unaware of your sorrow. I'm not unaware of your pain. I'm not unaware of your difficulty, your stress. Trust me. Trust me. This is for your benefit. You can't hear this right now. I'm going to say it anyway. This is for your benefit. And somewhere down the line, those words are going to ring true, and you're going to be so overjoyed that I allowed you to be used in the way that I'm allowing you to be used, that I allowed you to be stretched in the painful way that you got stretched. You're going to appreciate this. You're going to worship me for this. Because I'm going to shine through this.
Jesus had to die for the sin of the world to be forgiven. And he had to leave for the blessing of the presence of the Holy Spirit to come. Remember the different prepositions that refer to the Spirit's interaction with the world? We talked about them a couple of months ago. Para, in, and epi. Para means around. Holy Spirit around. En means inside. The Spirit inside. And epi means upon. Like that baptizing of the Spirit where you get drenched and some of it comes off of you and splashes on somebody else. Jesus refers to the para here when he's talking about the Spirit coming. He's coming to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Convict in the Greek means expose, reprove, refute. One commentator explains it like this. The the Holy Spirit comes to undeceive the world. I like that word. I don't know if it is a word, but I like it. He comes to undeceive the world. To counteract what the enemy is lying about. To counteract what your flesh might think as it logically goes along its way day to day. The Holy Spirit comes to work in opposition to that. What does the world desperately need to be undeceived about? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, the truth about man. Righteousness, the truth about God. And judgment, the truth about Satan. Jesus' explanation of sin for the context of the purpose of the Spirit's coming, it's not one of living up to a moral standard or it it, it failing at, at following a set of commands. That is sin. Because the word sin simply means missing the mark, not hitting the goal. It does mean that. But Jesus teaches something more important here. The fact that when we don't live up to a moral standard set by him or when we do fail at following the commands he has given, we have chosen to put our faith in something other than him and what he declares to be true. That's what we need to be undeceived about. Not that killing is wrong or lying is wrong or sleeping around is wrong. We know that's wrong. What we need to be undeceived about is that doing those things makes our life better somehow. That that's a better choice than what the creator of the universe has said for us. All sin comes down to a simple lack of faith. The belief that what is best for us is to do something differently than what God has said is best for us. I had a conversation this week with Pastor Steve Nordgren who came over for the anniversary service and he had a pretty bad motorcycle accident a couple days after that and he's laid up for several weeks and it's really been a time of revival for him. It's great to talk to him. He's excited about being flat of his back and, and not being able to get around much and having to have help for everything that he does. And he just, just, it's a great time to talk to Pastor Steve. I was talking to him this week and he, I hadn't been talking about what I was going to be teaching this Sunday. Not even where we were in the book of John. He's just riffing on what God has been saying to him as he's been laying there in his bed talking to God, laying on the floor talking to God all this time. And he's just telling me all this stuff that God is sharing with him and, and reminding him of and drawing him back to and opening his eyes to and new things and old things and all that. And in the middle of all that, he said, you know, man, I've been thinking about all the trouble that I had with drugs and addiction and and all of that stuff. And I'm realizing that was never the actual problem. It was just a symptom of my actual problem, which was that I hadn't put my trust and my faith in Jesus, not just for salvation, but for lordship. I had not decided to follow him no matter what he said, knowing in my heart that what he said was what was best for me even when it wasn't what I wanted. (laughs) He said, I hadn't put my faith and trust in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord. Redeemer and rule setter. That's my paraphrase of what he said. And as soon as he finished talking, I was like, man, Steve, check this out, man. This is what I'm teaching Sunday." awesome I love when God does that when he 
I call it synchronicity when things just start lining up and you hear the same message from three or four different sources or what what you're studying to to talk about on Sunday people start talking about beforehand I love stuff like that I think that's God at work here's the point if I honestly believe that there is one God that he has dominion over the world and that he cares for me if I really believe that then I can never be deceived into thinking that my way of doing things of handling things is more correct than his is better for me than his if the Bible says be sober minded be vigilant all that stuff about getting ready to stand in the gap for when the evil day comes then it's not better for me to inundate myself with information about politics and religion and the world and where where I know everything about all of that but I'm not spending any time with God that's not better for me I'm not being sober minded that means that when times are difficult I don't need coping mechanisms whether it's alcohol or drugs or sex or or learning or work or none of that what I need is to cry out to my God and 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 just pour my heart out before him and let him fill me with his presence that's so much more powerful than any of that stuff all of that stuff is temporary at best and I'm not even sometimes listen it's not even temporary it's non-existent sometimes as soon as you do that thing you immediately regret it there was, there was no respite in it at all but listen that thing is not the problem it's not just that if I could stop doing that thing, I will be aligned. No, you can stop doing that thing and still not be aligned with Jesus. You can stop doing that thing because you're aligned with Jesus. Because his word is true. You need to search the scriptures for all of the verses about hope and joy and peace and comfort where the blessing is and where the curse is and you just need to believe that trust him if we honestly believe there is one God that he has dominion and that he cares for us then we can't be deceived into trusting anything else and that's the ability the spirit gives us he came to undeceive the world that's his message he comes to point out the, this important distinction to me, the Spirit does, that Jesus is perfect, <laughs> that his ways are not my ways, that his ways lead to blessing while my ways lead to cursing. His conviction isn't simply the stating of the fact you have broken a rule. See, we think of the word conviction, we think of a court of law. And the evidence gets piled against you and then somebody speaks on behalf of the state and then you are found uh, guilty. You have been convicted of having committed this crime. We, we, we only think of conviction in that context. That's not, the, the Spirit does that. The Spirit will make you aware that you have committed a crime. But His purpose is to point you to Jesus in doing that. So the real purpose of conviction in this context is to free you up, to undeceive you, to get you sober-minded, to get your, your heart and your mind aligned with Jesus so that you, you actually come to the point where you agree. Not just that you were guilty, but that that way was better anyway. I should have just done that. Jesus says the Spirit will lead us into all understanding. All understanding of the word conviction. He will help us come around to the realization that breaking that rule wasn't just a bad idea because there were consequences for getting caught, but also because keeping that command would have been a blessing to us in and of itself. Because God's ways are actually what is best for us. You might want to write that down. But if we don't have faith in that, we're going to keep trying everything else first 
and coming back to him when, when none of those work. Okay, I'm back. I'm done. I tried. And listen, if that's where you are, come back. Stand there with wide open arms. He will wait for you to show faith. Trust me. Trust me. It's way better to skip all those other steps. Start with the faith. Start with the belief. Don't have to be undeceived. So that's Jesus' explanation of the Spirit coming to convict the world of sin. His explanation of of the conviction of righteousness for the context of the purpose uh, of this teaching. It's the confirmation that because of everything we know about Jesus, just from a historical perspective, is true. We can be sure that he did live a perfect, sinless life. He did offer himself up as a sacrificial offering, providing the atonement for all sin. And he did rise from the grave, proving that he has all authority and therefore is God. And he did ascend to the Father to take his proper position in heaven. Which means that God himself has provided evidence that Jesus' sacrifice has been deemed acceptable. That's the righteousness righteousness some people need to be undeceived about. Because your flesh works on you, and the enemy works on you, and the world works on you. Well, how could his dying cover your sin? How can that overturn your conviction in a legal court of morals? Because he said so. That's it. If I am convinced that he was truly righteous when he was here, then I can accept that when he says that my sins are covered by his death, they are covered. Done. And I am free indeed. Some people need to be undeceived about that. They're still carrying this concept of, well, I, just still, I still have to be better. I still got to be better to get to him, for him to love me. No, that only makes sense on earth. You get out past our realm, it's not about that. That's a human con- construct. And again, when we take a human construct and try to apply it to a spiritual truth, what are we doing? We're sinning we're not putting our trust and faith in him and what he said logical though it may sound it's all smoke and mirrors Jesus explanation of judgment for the context of the purpose of the spirits coming God is just he is the righteous judge there's always a final reckoning between God and the rebellious among his creatures always Even the God of this age, the prince of the powers of the air, is just another created being from the one who created everything. He has been judged and found wanting. He has been convicted of his crimes, and he will serve out eternal judgment. You need to know that. He has no power over you. He has no power over God. If you still have in your mind this odd idea of the clash of the titans between God and the enemy, oh no, who's going to win? You don't get it. The Freedom in Christ class that a lot of you have been through, I love how he describes it. He said said the only uh, big rivalry there between God and Satan is just like the rivalry between a hammer and a nail. One may seem dangerous and sharp and hardened, but it can only go where the the hammer drives it. Sin is not trusting Jesus and doing it your own way, no matter what thing you're talking about. 
Righteousness is the understanding the fact that the Father accepted Jesus as the sacrifice for your sin. Judgment is the understanding that the enemy is only in a holding pattern until he is chained in the abyss forever and ever. Get out of your mind even the concept of, of this ruling godlike creature in hell called Satan who has a throne and servants and they're partying down there and it, it's totally immoral and raucous and it's wonderful by a lot of people's standards. And blot that out of your mind. That could not be further from the truth. You will be chained up like a dog. Scripture says when we get a glimpse of the devil, we're going to be like, him? Really? He caused all this trouble? It's hard to believe because he's nothing. He has been judged. Don't fall into the camp that is worried about him. Don't fall into the camp certainly that follows him in anything or believes any of his lies. Don't be deceived. Ain't nobody getting away with nothing. God is just. There's always a final reckoning between God and the rebellious among the creatures he has created. If Satan, then humans. No matter what evil seems to be winning the day, whether it's Satan himself or just self-centered people around us, all whose sins are not covered by the sacrificial offering of the blood of Jesus Christ will be judged. Period. And so the Holy Spirit comes to make sure that we understand that sin is what separates us from a holy God to start with, that Jesus is the righteous one who can fix that problem for us who can be the stand-in for us as a sacrifice because the wages of sin is death. And hey, just in case you were wondering, this story does end in judgment for all those not covered by the blood of Christ. So the Spirit comes into the world to point us all that direction. To yearn earnestly that we would accept the truth and be undeceived. Verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Think about everything they've heard from the beginning of the Last Supper until now. Man. Wow. Yeah, I've got a lot more to share with you, Jesus says. Now is clearly not the time. There's always much more to learn about man and God and Satan and the connections and interactions between the three. But without the sorting out of Jesus, focus in, in regards to these things, sin and righteousness and judgment, those facts lose their meaning. There's really no point in taking in more information. Kind of like at the beginning of the book of John, we spent so much time there in chapter 1 because it just hammers home the deity of Jesus. He is God. You need to get that straight or else the rest of it doesn't mean anything. Well, this is the next step. Once you know that He is God, then you need to understand sin and righteousness and judgment in the context of what the Spirit is trying to tell you if you're lost or the Spirit is trying to strengthen you with if you're saved. These concepts just shared must be worked out rightly in our minds so that we can honestly interpret all the other information available. It's the context for all the other information available. Make sure you have prayerfully considered the weightier matters of sin and righteousness and judgment. Have you been thoroughly convinced by the Spirit that choosing to sin, choosing to miss the mark on purpose, is open rebellion against the God who loves you? Do you get that? Do I get that? Have you been thoroughly convinced by the Holy Spirit that Jesus' atonement is enough? That if you have believed in your heart and professed with your mouth that He is Lord, that you are saved. Have you settled that? 
that he truly is the spotless Lamb of God who does take away the sin of the world, that you can rest in his love poured out at Calvary? Have you been thoroughly convinced by the Holy Spirit that Satan is simply a created being? That he is condemned by his rebellion against God? That his power to entice you to sin has been dealt with on the cross? That you are no longer a slave to sin because the originator of sin has already been judged? Or, if you're lost, have you been convinced that you need to turn from sin? Because judgment is coming. I still have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. There's lots to think about, work through as we try to grasp the full meaning of what it means to be in fellowship with the Lord of all creation. Don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed. Let Jesus prioritize your list for you. As he declares what the Father wants declared and the Spirit reiterates that by bringing the understanding and the conviction where necessary, everything we need to know must have been filtered through these truths right here. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Start there. If you feel like you don't get it, even though you believe in in Jesus, you, you have thoroughly been drawn to him, You've given your life to him, but you still don't really understand why or how or what. Hey, that's where you start. Ask the Spirit to reveal things to you as quickly as you can handle. And that's different for everybody. And that's okay. God knows you better than anybody. He knows what you can handle today. So take what you can handle today from this message. Just think on it. Pray on it. Ask for help understanding it. This is the starting point. And this is the place we return to when things get out of balance. When we do take communion, this is one of the this is the touchstone. This is where we're coming back to. Think about that the next time we do that. Not only what did Jesus do, why did he have to do it? Where am I in the mix of all of this? Please, no matter what else you think about this week, settle where your faith is. Is it in your ways or is it in his ways? Because they are not the same. Most of us don't need to be undeceived about that. We understand that, that we don't think the same way God does. Pray for strength to choose correctly. Align with him. Let him be Lord. Please. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the comfort and the conviction that comes from understanding just how intimately involved you are in our lives. From understanding everything that you have done, all of the great steps you have taken to make sure that we can understand, that we can know what is needed, how it's provided, and why it's needed, and and that we can't provide any of that for ourselves. You've gone to great lengths to share that truth with us. Through the Word, through the presence of the Holy Spirit around us and in us, You are willing to unlock all the doors of truth if that's what we want. So I just pray that that's what we would want. As we talk about revival around here, it comes down to this. Are we ready for revival? Are we ready to align ourselves so closely with you that we cannot be deceived into thinking that anything of the flesh or anything from the enemy is the way to go? 
Are we strong enough to withstand being turned on? Both from without and within the church. You said you shared this knowledge that these times would come so that we would not be made to stumble. We don't need to walk around in fear. We need to walk around with our heads held high with the the understanding that we are more than conquerors through you. But that doesn't mean we don't need to be aware of where the traps are so that we can choose to avoid them. That is living out our faith. That's what it looks like. Making choices minute by minute, day by day as to who we are going to be. Who do we want to be? Help us with that where we struggle. Lord, and draw us near to you. Have your way. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Love y'all.